You know, um, one, one of the great parts about this job is that occasionally you get to share the stage with someone like Mr. Bill Harrison, because whenever I'm asked by people unfamiliar with VES about the school, they always want to know who your most prominent alumni are. And we always talk about Mr. Harrison, Mr. Bowles. And so to be able to, again, share the stage with someone like that who's been such a legend, um, is, 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 it's truly an honor. Um, so good morning, VES faculty, students, and students. I am thrilled to welcome you to the very first Thomas Family Speaker Series, which was endowed last year through a gift of Lee and Dorothy Thomas, class of 1962. Lee Thomas has been a generous benefactor to VES for a long time. And he helped make the con construction of this theater possible by donating the lobby in the memory of donating the lobby in memory of his late brother Bob, class of 1960. And the Thomas Family Speaker Series will bring speakers to VES every year to discuss a wide range of topics. And it is fitting today that our inaugural speaker, Bill Harrison, is a VES classmate of Lee Thomas's, and he even played basketball in this very building with the grandfathers of Kate and Libby Flippin, Lucy Poe, Will Baggett, and the great uncles of George Niblett and John Barber, long before this was converted into a theater. So please welcome your head counselor, Caroline Carrington. She has 61 years and three head counselor plaques, apart from Bill Harrison, so, and she's going to make his introduction. Born and raised in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, Mr. Harrison attended Virginia Episcopal School as a member of the class of 1962. He was BES's 47th head counselor and a member of the honor committee. With his father, Billy Harrison, class of 31, and brother, Frank Harrison, class of 65, also attending the school, Mr. Harrison and his family have deep BES ties. During his time on campus, Mr. Harrison immediately stood out as a star on the basketball team. At forward, he played a crucial role for the bishops, commanding the court as an impressive shooter, rebounder, and passer. Additionally, Mr. Harrison also stood out in the classroom, bringing an intense work ethic, positive attitude, and sense of professionalism into his BES classes, consistently impressing faculty members with his study habits and commitment to excellence. With his achievements both on and off the court, Mr. Harrison quickly caught the attention of legendary coach Dean Smith at the University of North Carolina. Coach Smith actively recruited Mr. Harrison, and after graduating from VES in 1962, Mr. Harrison matriculated to UNC, where he was a member of the basketball team. As a basketball player at UNC, Coach Smith noted that Mr. Harrison practiced very hard and pushed his teammates to be better. He had the kind of attitude I wanted all players to have. During his time at UNC, Mr. Harrison earned a degree in economics and joined the Zeta Psi fraternity while remaining on the basketball team, serving as a positive leader and role model that encouraged his peers and teammates. After graduating from UNC in 1966, Mr. Harrison moved to New York where he joined Chemical Banking Corps' training program. Over the next 30 years, he applied all that he learned about being a valuable team player on the basketball court to his career, rising through the ranks at Chemical Bank before succeeding his mentor during the Chemical Bank merger with Chase in 1995. At this time, Mr. Harrison became the chairman and CEO of Chase before successfully navigating the acquisition of J.P. Morgan & Co. and becoming the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase & Co. Following an incredibly successful 40-year career as a leader in the field of global banking and finance, Mr. Harrison retired from J.P. Morgan Chase in 2006. Outside of his professional career, Mr. Harrison and his wife, Anne, currently reside in Greenwich, Connecticut, and enjoy traveling. They have two daughters, Katie and Anna. Additionally, Mr. Harrison has dedicated ample time and resources to other institutions, sharing his val valuable insight and professional experience as a member of many different boards. Mr. Harrison served on the board of visitors at the University of North Carolina's Kenan Flagler Business School, the board of directors of Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts Incorporated, the board of directors for Catalyst, the board of overseers of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, the board of directors of the Partnership for New York City, and the board of the World Trainer Center Memorial Foundation. Virginia Episcopal School is pleased to welcome Mr. William B. Harrison, Jr., class of 62, to campus as the inaugural Thomas Family Series speaker. Thank you, Caroline and Garth, for that generous introduction. Um, I am honored to be here. VES meant a lot to me, and I'm just delighted to be back. Um, I was telling somebody outside the local 
news media here. I wanted a five minutes, which I did right before I came in. I told the guy that, I think it was Jacob, really nice man, and I said, news bus to be slow in, in Lynchburg if you want to interview me. But it is great to be here, and a lot obviously has changed uh, since I was here. Um, the buildings especially, most importantly, the fact that we have women, which we didn't have when I was here, um, and a lot of foreign students. Um, and that's so great to see. I think what hasn't changed is still feels like the, the culture and what VES can give to you as at this stage in your life as you're developing and growing and learning uh, had a huge impact on me, and I'm going to talk about some of that, but uh, I don't think that's changed from what I hear. So, um, again, great to be here, and what I thought I'd do, Gar suggested that maybe tell a little bit about your life story and some lessons learned and advice. Uh, so that's what I will uh, try to do, um, and let me start with with sort of my life story. And, and the bottom punchline of my life story is, is it's one of hope, it's one of opportunity for everyone. Uh, I was lucky uh, to have a successful career and family life and friends, um, but it can happen to you. And, and, and I remind people, I was definitely, and Caroline was a little generous about me being an outstanding student here. I was an average student here at best, um, and an average student at, at uh, Carolina. Uh, so I would say, you know, if, if I can do it, anybody can do it. And I'll talk about, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, um, one of the things that, uh, let me show you. And, and, and really, why, why do I say that everybody can be successful in this room? Um, you start with the fact that, that we're all better than we think we are. Even though you think you have it figured out, you think you, you, things are going great, you can be even better. You just, you just can. And, and, and how many people have been on an outward bound expedition? Anybody in the room? Um, so you have some. And, uh, I was on the Outward Bound board, went on probably five or six ex expeditions, and, and I loved it. And one of the things that Outward Bound does to sort of make you realize some of the things I'm saying is they put you in these, through, wilderness, through a wilderness experience, they put you in these situations that when they say, we got to do this repelling or we got to do this rock climbing or hiking all night or whatever you say, not only can't I do that, I do not want to do that. And yet, they're able to encourage you to do it. You do it, and when you do it, you say, wow, I did that. Um, and that's sort of life, you know? And one of the lessons that I would just encourage everybody to, 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 to understand, and one of the slogans out of Atwood Vine was, we are all better than we know we are, and if you can ever be made to see it, you'll never settle for less. And that's definitely true. Um, the other thing that's really important to to put in perspective on the big on the big picture uh, is that uh, this we we live we many of us are born uh, we all live in the in the greatest country in the world and with all the discord going on between the right and the left and the political process and all of that that's happened before we'll get over that we'll get beyond it that won't affect this country long term. Uh, and we are just a country of great opportunity, the melting pot of the world, and these will be great, great attributes. Uh, entrepreneurialism, uh, everything that you guys know about uh, is, is something that will carry the day here. I think certainly during your careers, uh, the United States will remain the greatest country uh, in, in the world, and that'll give, that alone will give you uh, a lot of opportunity for sure. So let me just take you through um, um, my 
my quick life story. Uh, and then I'm going to connect some things that, that would be lessons learned along the way from that. Uh, because I have seen a lot. Um, so, as Caroline said, I was born in a small town in eastern North Carolina, Rocky Mount. I had great parents, like most of you do. Uh, I had great friends, I had great teachers, I had great coaches. And so, it was a very comfortable environment. I sort of discovered who I was and was comfortable in my own skin. And that, growing up in a small town, I think you get a lot of that support and interaction. Uh, a lot of what you're getting here at BES. Uh, so, um, my only passion at that point was, um, I was, a, I was a, not a good student. My mom used to beat on me every day. Uh, and, and, and I just worried about, I, I was just focused on basketball. Uh, so, I finished my junior year at Rocky Mount High School. And because my dad had been to BES, he said, I think it might be a good idea. And you might enjoy it. It's going to be yes. So I said, great. So I did and uh, came here. I repeated the 11th grade. And that was really helpful because it gave me another year to sort of learn and establish myself and, and create a better, more solid foundation. Uh, and uh, my first year here, because of basketball, it helped me to get integrated into the school. We had a great team. We won the conference championship. Um, and it was, a, it was a wonderful year getting to know everybody and developing new friends and whatever. It was a great experience. But one of the important things that happened is that commencement exercises that year, you go, my parents came up and uh, sitting there and they announced uh, the head counselor and head of honor committee jobs. And at that point, whoever had those had both, not the case today. And so I'm sitting out there and I'm wondering who's going to get that. And uh, lo and behold, it was me. And I'm like, wow, this is really. And uh, it was a, it was it, it made me start thinking about somebody, the faculty, the headmaster, others, maybe are seeing something of leadership in this person. And it was a, it was it was the first sort of recognition to me that maybe I could be more than a basketball player. Not that I even wanted to be, but it was like discovery. It was an opening up. And so, uh, great senior year here. Um, as Caroline said, was recruited by Dean Smith to play basketball in North Carolina. I was not, uh, I was a good high school player. I was not a good college player. Um, but I had fun being on the team. I learned a lot from him, wonderful man. Um, and uh, and then, then it came time to graduate. And uh, that's the challenge we all face your age and whatever, what's the next step? What's the next step for you now going into college? And for me, it was the next step. How do, what am I gonna do? What's my job gonna be? And, and sort of back to um, school, being an average student, I used to sit in class my senior year. You probably, by then, you only had a couple of hours a, a day at most. And I, I didn't, I said, man, this is, these two hours are long. And next year, I've gotta find a job somewhere and, and work eight, nine hours a, a, a day, that's not gonna be fun. Uh, and uh, that, was, that was really what I was thinking. Well, <clears throat> you start talking to people. I had a, a grandfather that started a bank in Rocky Mount during the Depression, so I used to work there in the summers for him. And he used to say, son, when you graduate from college, you ought to go to New York for a couple of years. And, uh, and, and get some experience and come back and work for us. Um, so I sort of parked that. I didn't really think that would ever be something I would do. Um, so, but then I started getting serious about it in the last month of, of school at my senior year at Carolina. So I said, okay, banking, and I'm gonna give that a shot. So I went up and, and interviewed two or three New York banks, got an offer from Chemical Bank, which at that point was one of the top five banks uh, in New York, one of the top ten banks in the country, uh, and also interviewed in North Carolina. I interviewed NCNB, which is now Bank of America, and um, they were great. And they said, "Well, Bill, why don't you? We really want you to come." And matter of fact, if you want to, you can run our office in Chapel Hill. And I'm like, "Wow, how good is that? You know, I get to stay in Chapel Hill with all my friends and connections to the fraternity system and 
and, and the, the sports teams, uh, and just being in North Carolina. That was my comfort zone. Um, so I had two good choices. And the hard one, of course, was getting out of that comfort zone and, and taking a risk. And that's what I did. I don't know quite why, but I did it. Uh, my, my vision of, uh, of going to New York would be, okay, if I can last two years there, go through a little training program, I'll come back to North Carolina, and uh, that'll, that'll, be, that'll be great. And uh, that, that was as far as out as I could think. Um, so I went to New York, and lo and behold, what happened is I enjoyed going to work every day. Um, and I enjoyed the people, I enjoyed the learning, um, and it was, it was fantastic. Uh, I love New York, develop friends, you develop your clubs and all the, in the infrastructure around you, and it was, it was spectacular. So I did that for, I was a client, I was a banking client manager for eight years uh, after during that time. And then the bank said, uh, this is probably, I was 28, 29 by the time, and the bank said, we, we, we're opening up a San Francisco corporate office, we want you to go out there and start it. And I said, I really don't want to do that. I mean, I, I'm very comfortable here in New York. And this is, again, this comfort zone issue. And uh, they said, no, you really you should. They were very patient. Um, and they would come back and say, what do you mean you don't want to do it? Everybody would love to go to San Francisco and have that job. And I said, well, go ask one of them, because I don't want to go. <laughs> um, so they were, they were very patient. And I, I took the job, went out there. It took me about three days. To, to fall in love with San Francisco. And that was my second real learning experience because I'd, I'd gone from a banker and a fun job um, to now I had to build a, an, an office of eight to 10 professionals to work with me to cover all of uh, Chemical Bank's business on the West Coast. So we went out and hired a bunch of people and brought a few people from New York. And that was my first management job, managing 10 people. And uh, I discovered that, hey, I like this, you know, managing uh, these people, becoming a leader with these people is something that I like to do, and maybe I'm good at it. Um, and, 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 and so we built a great team out there. We had, we had a lot of success. And three years later, I get a call from the chairman, and he said, uh, Bill, we'd like for you to go to London. And, and, and run the UK. Well, the UK at that point for the Chemical Bank was a big operation. 1,300 people, this is 10 that I'm managing. I'm going into managing 1,300 people in different businesses. All, all of a sudden, the trading and derivatives and operations and, and risk management all came under me. So I was a real novice. And the bank took a big risk on me to do that. At any rate, I went. And of course, um, the uh, we had an exec committee of eight Brits, basically, and they looked at me coming in. I was 34 years old, I think, and looked at me coming in like, you know, what are you doing here? You know, you don't know the country, you don't know the business. Um, so I had a huge uh, management challenge on my hand, but I, but I, I'd, I'd gotten to like that, and. Uh, and, and what made it worse is that these eight people who are all running different groups didn't like each other, um, which made my job even harder to try to pull it together. And it got to be pretty bad, and I met this organizational consultant person, uh, and he said, what you need to do, let's have a, I'll help you do an offsite uh, outside of London with the, your team of eight people, and we'll peel the onion back. And he told me how he was gonna do that. And I said, wow, you know, that probably makes sense, but just help me, don't, let's not peel the onion back so far that all these people end up leaving. And I'm gonna tell you what we did, you know, it's like unbelievable. So we get out there, and again, these eight people don't love each other. Um, and we get out there, and you start the program at eight o'clock in the morning, you have eight people sitting in a circle, and you go to the first guy, John Jones, sitting to my right. So. Okay, John, um, I'm gonna ask everybody to go around the, the room and talk about what they do not like about you personally. And <laughs> so 
because these people didn't take a liking each other, that was pretty easy for them to do. They spoke up. Of course, when, when he got hammered, he couldn't wait for the next guy. He was going to catch up. So that goes around, gets really negative, big time negative. Uh, then it shifts into, okay, let's go around the room and let's talk about what we like about, what we don't like about how he is managing his, his particular responsibility at the bank in London. And of course, a lot of chatter there, it was all negative and whatever. And one of the things the consultant told me, he said, if there'll come a point, probably a day and a half into this, where somebody's going to say, hey, look, this is so negative, can't we talk about something positive? So, we, so that, sure enough, that happened. Somebody raised a hand. So that shifted into reversing the whole thing. So then we start with John Jones again. Okay, let's talk about what we like about him personally. And what the beautiful thing about this is everybody has, has his qualities that people like, dislike. And it just depends on how you can put that in a balance and, and, and manage it. And so all of a sudden he's hearing people say, who he thought hated him, say, well, then, you know, I like this about him. So that was all that started building this very positive mindset. And then you reverse it again and say, okay, what, is he, what, is he, what did he do? What does he do in his job that, uh, that we like? And again, a lot of positive things come out about what we like about what he does. So you do that for about a day, and then you uh, spent the, the next day talking about, okay, we now know each other better. We understand each other better. Uh, let's, um, let, let's figure out how we're going to build a team and a culture and how are we going to run the place effectively? And we went back to London and we became a very good team. Not a great team, but a good team. And that, that whole process taught me a lot about, about talking to people, about listening, about responsibilities of a leader to try to figure out a way to bring groups together, to make them more efficient, to make them work together, to make them enjoy their job. Uh, and, and that happened, and I never did that again because it's pretty harsh, but one of the things I really integrated into every job I had was, was really getting people to, to want to receive feedback and to give feedback and do it in a constructive way. And I, I, I do that at home with the family and whatever. So I'm just a great believer, and I would encourage you, um, one of the sort of the lessons learned here, to, uh, to seek feedback and to uh, constructively give feedback when, it, when, when it's appropriate because everybody can grow that way and you'll begin to develop a, a better team. Um, so, uh, then after, uh, after that I was asked to go back to New York and ran a big uh, division for, for Chemical Bank and then in 1990, and this was the beginning of a real learning experience, in 1990, Chemical Bank and Manufacturers Hanover, which were two of the top five banks in New York City, then uh, we were losing altitude competitively, so we said we need to do something. So we did the first big merger of the, of the banks in the country uh, between those two. People sort of thought we were nuts, but we did it, and it worked. And we, we added value, we started creating shareholder value. Uh, then in, in 1996, we merged with Chase, took the Chase name, um, and then did a few other small acquisitions, and then, in, in two, and, and then uh, along the way there, what was interesting, again, this is back to this comfort zone, taking some risk. Um, in 1997, uh, we did the J.P. Morgan merger in 2000. In 1997, the chairman at the time um, had told me in a lunch, he said, uh, he said, Bill, um, I'm just telling you, you're on the short list, my short list, uh, as to who I recommend to the board to be the next CEO. And uh, I said, Walter, I, I'm honored. I really appreciate it. But if given the opportunity, I'm not sure I really want to do it. And he's like, whoa, you know. Um, and so, uh, not that it was interesting. Not that I was afraid of the job, because every job I got actually played more to my strengths. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. You've got to find things that you like to do and you're good at it. I was better at being a leader, manager, strategist. How do you win? How do you build cultures and get a team to, together? I was better at that than being a pure banker. And uh, uh, so, so I went and talked to my wife. Bill, you really ought to do it. Talked to my parents who I'm very close to. You've know, you got to do it. You really need to do it. Talked to my friends. 
Everybody said, are you crazy? I have to do that. So anyway, I talked to enough people um, that I would have probably done it, but I wasn't sure that it really gave me a, a comfort level. And that's another sort of lesson learned to reach out when you have any kind of issue you're struggling with. Reach out and talk to as many people as you can and, and, and learn from it. So I took the job. And about a year later, 1998, um, we, um, we decided, the CEO decided at the time we needed to do another big merger, particularly in the investment banking space, which we were trying to build. So the best option for us at that time was J.P. Morgan. And so he talked to me about it, and I thought that was great. And so he went down to see the chairman of J.P. Morgan, the CEO of J.P. Morgan, and said, okay, here's, the, here's what I'll offer you. I, Walter Shipley, CEO, will step down. We'll do a merger of equals financially. Um, you, you um, as, as head of uh, J.P. Morgan, will be the CEO. Bill will be number two. He's five years older than you are, so no promises to him, and he's happy working for you. Uh, we'll move down to your headquarters in New York. Uh, on Wall Street, we were in Midtown. It'll be J.P. Morgan, not J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, and uh, he said, no, I don't want to do that. He said, I don't, I don't like the deal. I don't like your retail business. I don't like some of the stuff you guys are doing strategically. Well, I, I'd known him from London, so I told Walter, I said, let me go down and talk to him. This is crazy. So I went down and had a, had a nice chat with him. And I, I said, I said, you really? You don't want to do this? I mean, you're... You guys are losing altitude. This is the new model, what we're building, size and scale, and building something bigger and better. Uh, and uh, he said, no, I don't, I don't like it. I don't want to do it. And, and, and a year later, in 99, I became CEO. Three months after I became CEO, um, they, J.P. Morgan continued to lose altitude. We continued to gain altitude from a market perspective. And <clears throat> so I... Um, I picked up the phone and called him, and I said, I want to come talk to you again. He said, fine, meet me in my apartment tonight. I went over to his apartment, and I said, okay, here's the deal. We will offer you a 30% premium, so we're buying you. It's not a merger of equals. We're buying you. Uh, you guys will move up to our headquarters at Midtown. Uh, it'll be J.P. Morgan Chase, um, and you'll be chairman for, uh, not executive chairman for, a year and then you'll leave and I'll take over as CEO on day one. And he said, okay. Well, if you look back at that, it was like one of the real amazing things in, in corporate banking history because J.P. Morgan should have been, if they'd had a vision and understood strategy better, they should have been the consolidator. When we did the first merger with Manhattan Manufacturers Hanover and Chemical in 1990, J.P. Morgan at that time was nine to ten times larger from a market capitalization perspective than we were. Uh, they should have been the consolidator, but they were insular, they were great, they were the best bank in the country, and they thought so. And it's another thing you got to be careful about. you got to keep changing, and they weren't willing to change and accept. We were, we were taking risks, we did, we did all these deals, and all of a sudden we bought, well, we bought them. It should have never happened. Turns out we did the deal, it was a great deal. Um, and then um, in, in 2004, uh, we, we um, bought and merged with Bank One and Jamie Dimon. And that was a wonderful deal because uh, I didn't have a great successor. Despite all these mergers, you would think you'd have a lot, but didn't. Uh, and so we, um, we, uh, we, we bought them. I stayed on as CEO for two years, chairman for one year, and then uh, Jamie took over. And, um, he's done a fabulous job because when Jamie and I sat down, you always write a vision statement when you do these mergers. Okay, well, who, what do we want to be? And we, we, Jamie and I decided we want to be the best bank in the world. We're not going to put a time frame on it, but we really think we have an opportunity to do that. And it turns out it was true. And Jamie took it over from the base uh, we created and has built the best bank in the world. And, and um, it was... It was, it was very satisfying to me, and I remember the day we announced that in January of 2004, I went home to my wife, and I said, I said, Ann, this is the most satisfying day of my business career. Why is that? I said, because CEOs worry about a lot of things, but one of the most important things you worry about, number one, is your strategic platform, which gives you 
value creation sustainability. In other words, you have a platform that can keep doing well because you built the platform that way, you built the culture right and all of that. And I said, we've done that. And the second thing is, I have the best successor you can have. And it's turned out um, that, that, that that's true. That Jamie is, I think, the best uh, banking CEO in the, probably in the world. Um, so I said, those two things, I don't have to worry about anymore. So we had a great transition. Um, then I retired uh, 16 years ago, and life has been great, family, and done a lot of other stuff, but, uh, but, but life has been good. So, you know, so the bottom line of that story is that uh, what I went through can happen to anybody. I mean, I will say again, Rocky Mount, small town, C student, didn't know what I wanted to do, and I ended up being fortunate and having a, having, a, having a successful career. That can happen to you, and I'm not suggesting that you want to do that, but I am suggesting that you can be and should be um, very optimistic if you work hard and do a lot of the right things, that you can have a great career uh, and success, however you want to define success. I'm not suggesting you need to go into the corporate world. I'm not suggesting you but you got to define success. What's the success to you? I'd start with being happy is the most important thing and enjoying what you're doing. But, um, but that's, that's really important. So that's sort of some, you know, some, a little bit of life history, a lot of life history. And, and uh, I want to just link into uh, a few things that would be advice to you. And some of these things won't work for you. Some of these don't make sense. But some of them may. And again, I think the more people you can listen to about, uh, about how you do things or what, how you can uh, develop yourself, the, more, the better you're going to be, the more you're going to develop, the happier you're going to be. So um, one, of, one of the things that I think is, is really important is have a vision. Um, now, I didn't have a great vision, but I had some, uh, and it kept developing. Some people are lucky. Uh, they know exactly right now, sitting in this room, what they want to be uh, in their life. I, I didn't, but I did have a vision that was sort of halfway and it kept developing. So think about, think about your vision, your goals out there. Maybe just, okay, I want to get in this college and have a great four years, or I want to do whatever, but, but start developing that, that vision. Uh, the second thing which I commented on is talk to people. Um, uh, you, you run across a lot of tough situations in your, in your life, and the more people you can bring into that, uh, the, the, the better you're going to be able to solve the issue you're talking about, and the more creative that process will allow you to be. Uh, so, so, so talk to people. And uh, on the whole notion of talking to people, um, I just couldn't encourage you more to develop at this stage um, uh, a curiosity about things and, and, and that leads into talking to people. So take advantage, even if you're in the ninth grade here, you know, you sort of say, well, I don't have to worry about what I'm going to do when I graduate. Well, the more you can start talking to people and sort of trying to figure it out, the better you're going to be, the more comfortable you're going to be. Uh, and so take advantage when you see somebody, because you run across, everybody in this room has the ability to run across some interesting people. Um, at any point in time. And when you do that, take advantage. Uh, it could be your parents, friends, and whatever, you know, but just talk about life, talk about what you can learn from them, because you will learn a lot and it'll help you sort of start evolving into, okay, what might I want to do uh, in life? How do I want to be happy? Um, the other one I've talked a lot about, uh, get out of your comfort zone. Uh, I, I was a great comfort zone person. Uh, thank goodness, in most cases, I would always take a little risk and do it. But, but, but every day, every situation you're going to have, you're going you're to be in your comfort zone or out of your comfort zone. And the more you can sort of, not doing crazy stuff, but the more you can sort of talk about getting out of your comfort zone and taking a little bit of risk, um, I, I think that's going to allow you to be uh, more of who you want to be. And, and most importantly, to maximize your potential, because we all have so much potential that a lot of it goes untapped. Um, and along the way, don't be afraid to, uh, as you do that, to fail. Everybody talks about, oh, you can't fail and whatever. 
you you got to be able to fail. You got to accept that and then move on, and figure out the next thing you, you want to do. So don't be afraid to fail. Uh, another one would be. Um, um, Uh, this is one I'm sure you get tired of hearing about, but it's really true, is uh, adapting to change. Um, uh, and, and I'll just tell you that, that as much as most people think they're okay at changing and managing change, most people have a hard time with it. Um, some people do it a lot better than others. And, and in a merger environment, imagine this, because it really brings this subject out. You put two big companies together, you're trying to, man, you're trying to merge the cultures and get the best of, of each. Um, if you come into that process with a view that, okay, I'm Chase, and the way we did this, sorry, J.P. Morgan, is not right. Th this is the way we do it. You, you can't, you gotta be able to listen and say, okay, maybe there is a different way. Let's talk about it and figure it out and change. And what, you'll, what I found is that um, you know, probably I'd say 15, 20% of the people at least uh, had, had real trouble with that. And they don't survive uh, uh, because, because they become a burden to everybody. And uh, you got to be willing to not compromise, but, but to be willing to say, okay, that's, that's what we ought to do. That's change. I'm going to change. And <clears throat> as we know, and the merger process really brings that out in a very accelerated way. But your life is getting accelerated just because, just think about in your generation, what technology is going to do, what AI is going to do. Uh, it's crazy. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot of change. And I, we've had a lot of change just from technology in my lifetime. It'll keep accelerating and change will keep happening. And the only advice I'd give you is really try to be comfortable that you can try to understand that and, and, and go with the flow of change versus fighting it. Because if you fight it, it's hard, you know? It just, it just is. Um, <clears throat> another, one, uh, another one would be um, um, have a positive attitude. And th this, is a, this is one of my real um, hot buttons of, of that groups of people. Uh, I talk about attitude a lot. Uh, and attitude is so important because everybody can change their attitude and have a positive attitude. Uh, you can't, people who don't have the intelligence, you can't go up and say, I'm sorry, you're not that smart, you're not gonna make it. So that intelligence is not the, the issue, or not the thing you can control as much. Uh, but attitude is, and it is hugely important. Um, I mean, I'd go into a meeting, we're trying to get something done in the bank, especially in the merger process, and you got 15 people in the room, and you throw out a challenge, okay, this is what we need to do, guys, I want you to go figure it out, and, um, you know, you'll have, you'll have a lot of people, the, the, the people who have the positive attitudes will say, oh, wow, that's going to be tough, but, man, let's go do it, let's, let's, let's learn from it and, and, and create something that's going to be fun and productive and whatever, and then you'll have... You know, 10, 15 percent of the people in that room generally would say, "Oh man, do we, you, we really have to do this again and go through this and whatever." And and guess what? You don't like that. Uh, uh, you want people around you who are positive, and that's true not only in business. It's true in a family. I, I talk to my girls about this and about having a positive attitude, and we sit around sometimes and. And uh, I'll say, okay, attitude check, you know, and they get it because we've talked about this a lot. Um, because you can control that. Um, and here's just a really interesting story on attitude. Uh, we had gone through the J.P. Morgan merger, and um, um, at the 9-11 Trade Center tragedy, um, a firm called Sandler O'Neill, which is a small investment banking boutique, had gotten was on the 90th floor and got hit. They lost 65, 70 percent of the firm that day, including three of their top four guys, who were all killed. Um, the, the one who was left, a guy named Jimmy Dunn, who was a friend, has become a really good friend, um, said, "I'm going to try to save the firm." And that was like an almost an impossible task. He got a lot of help from 
of allow other from the banks and others to help him do that. He actually did it. So nine months later, he was on 60 Minutes talking about the firm had been saved. He's now creating jobs again. He's going to take all this money and help the families who were wiped out, and and he did that. So he's he's a he's a positive attitude guy. So he gets a call from the head of his Chicago office said, Mr. Dunn, I want you to come out and, and see the troops and give them a little pep talk and whatever. So Jimmy said, fine. So he goes up, shows up at the office and walks in and he says, um, the guy says, okay, the first person I want you to see, Mr. Dunn, um, is so-and-so and he is, he is our ring maker. He's our best trader. He makes us a lot of money, uh, but he's got a bad attitude. But other than that, he is great. Jimmy says, I don't want to see him. And <clears throat> so he said, oh, you got to see him. And so he said, okay, here's the deal. You stay in the room and watch and tell me how I did. So the guy comes in and Jimmy says, okay, um, I don't have much time, but I want to talk to you um, about attitude. And he said, on a scale of uh, one to 10, 10 being the best, how would you rate your colleague Susie Smith on the trading floor? Oh, she's like a nine, nine and a half. She's awesome. So how would you write, write John Jones? Well, he's like, he's not. He's like really good too. And Jimmy said, well, that's good. And he said, so how would you rate me as leader of the firm, Jimmy Dunn? And he said, Mr. Dunn, I'm not sucking up to you, but I got to tell you, you get 15. You, you, have been, you have been awesome, which, which he had been. And Jimmy said, well, that's very nice. Thank you. And he said, now I want you to rate yourself an attitude. And this kid says, uh, well, I'm like a five, five and a half. Jimmy says, that's not good enough. He said, I want you to get up right now, go back to your desk and, and write me a letter of resignation dated 30 days from now. And if you can't do that, uh, change your attitude, call me. Um, I want you to leave the firm. The guy's like, whoa. He gets up and leaves the room. Jimmy turns to his Chicago manager and says, Okay, how'd that do? He said, Jimmy, that's our best guy. He's going to quit. And, and Jimmy says, I don't care. You know, if he can't change his attitude, we don't want people like that in the company. Um, good news is the guy did change his attitude because you can change. A lot of times you're not aware of it. So I sat there and listened to Jimmy tell that story because I got him to come in and speak to some senior people at the bank one night. And I listened to it. I said, wow, what a powerful, simple story. So I just, we just developed the voicemail capability so I could go out to our 100,000 employees and with a message. So I went out the next morning and uh, I said, I just heard the great message last night on attitude. And so uh, this is what I want everybody in the company to do today. When you go home tonight, I want you to rate yourself one to 10 on attitude. If you're nine or 10, God bless, go help somebody who's not. But if you're not, if you're five, six or seven, I want you to change your attitude or if not, I want you to leave the company. Well, our HR human resource people said, Bill, you can't say that to people, you know? <laughs> and I said, no, it's, 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 it's important that we do. And uh, so we did it, and I got more positive feedback on that than most anything I did because a very small percent are actually people with bad attitudes. And a lot of them don't know it, a lot of them can change. So it became a real mantra around the company to, uh, to, to sort of execute and, and talk about it because you can control it and it's, and it's not something to be embarrassed about to talk about attitude. Um, here's another one, um, put things in perspective. Uh, th this, is, this is to me a really important one. We all run across tough situations in our lives, uh, personally, business-wise, whatever. Um, it, it, it's really helpful if you can try to put things in perspective and because most of the time you can figure out the worst case that you can manage. And my example on this that I'll, I'll tell you about is we've done the J.P. Morgan merger, the, after the dot-com bust, private, private equity business got hit really hard with losses. We had some big companies like Enron that went bankrupt. We had big exposures. So I was getting a lot of pressure uh, as, a, as a CEO from the market uh, and the stock price. And uh, so I had two friends, that, partners that came in, guys that worked for me, came in and said, Bill, look, we just want to talk to you. Look, you're doing, all, you're doing a good job, you're doing all you can, and I just feel sorry that you're having to go through all this, and uh, this is too bad. 
And I said, hey guys, look, let me, let me tell you what, how I think about this. Um, first of all, let's remember that we last year earned $4 billion. We're one of the best banks in the country, but most importantly, we'll get through this because we have the wherewithal to do it, but we have a great future to be one of the best banks, if not the best bank in the world. And, and so that's where I start. But then I say, okay, worst case, what's the worst case? I said, worst case for me is that tomorrow morning the board fires me. I said, if that were to happen, uh, I'd be sad. But what I, would, what I would really get to on the worst case is board fires me. Uh, I said, I'd be sad, but, but I'm, I've got a wonderful family and kids. Uh, I'm financially secure. I'm healthy. I've had a career that's way beyond what I ever would have guessed. So am I going to feel sorry for myself? Absolutely not. Uh, and that's worst case. And I didn't think it would happen, and it didn't. Um, but I, I think uh, quite often, I, I mean, I try to do that. You, know, you get a problem, fast forward the tape to sort of a worst case outcome and say, can, how can I manage that and can I manage it? And usually you can find a way. It'll give you, it'll give you some comfort. Um, another one, uh, Real hot button of mine is leadership. I know you talk about leadership a lot. Leadership is just such a great, powerful word. Leadership matters. It matters in life. It matters in sports. It matters who's running the company. It matters who runs the country. Uh, leadership is a big deal. And, but what I try to do at, at J.P. Morgan with the people is to get them to understand that leadership is not just coming from the top people in our organization. Uh, leadership can involve everybody. And the way I would define leadership, uh, and this goes all the way down to the very bottom of any organization, the last two people on the, on the list, um, you, you, would, you would say um, lead, leadership is about having a view about how to make something better. In other words, you see something, how can I make it better? It could be something really simple. Uh, and then, then having the the confidence and the wherewithal and the, the ability to go talk to people and say this is how we could change this and, and get some following, get people to follow you. Leaders have to have followers. So even at the bottom level, you can have people um, uh, doing this at, at a very effective way. And, 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 and just think about it as CEO of 100,000 people, no way am I going to know much beyond two or three levels down what's going on. So you got a lot of great stuff going on in the company, um, and, and you want the creativity coming up from the bottom as well as the top, and everybody talking, everybody um, uh, sort of melding together on that. So everybody can be a leader. You can be a leader right now. Um, just just have a view on something and try to constructively um, change it if it makes sense. Um, and I would encourage you to, to do that. Um, Team player. We don't even have to talk about team play. I mean, you've got a lot of athletes in the room. Team play is not only important in sports, but it's important in families, it's important in life, and it was certainly important at, uh, at, at, at J.P. Morgan. Um, Dean Smith, people ask you, what'd you learn from Dean Smith as a basketball coach? I said, I learned a lot, but he was very specific with three sort of, uh, his slogan he used, which works everywhere. And, and Dean Smith's slogan went to the team was, play hard, play smart, and play together. And if you think about those three things, it works for anybody. It works for a team, it works for a company, uh, it works for whatever. Um, another one's work hard. We all know that, but you know, uh, you can work, working hard is uh, really important. To work hard, I would argue, you really need to find something you like to do. Uh, and and uh, when you do, it allows you the chance to work really hard or even harder, and, and that's obviously really important. Um, uh, I'm going blind, so excuse me, I've got to put my glasses on. Um, another one would be... Uh, uh, be authentic. Now, what does that mean? It means be who you are. You can, you can hear me make some comments today on things that you might say, okay, attitude or whatever it is, I can do better. You don't want to change who you are. You want to, you know, great leaders are authentic. They are who they are. You don't want to try to be somebody you're fundamentally not. You do want to be somebody who's learning, talking, 
and listening and growing to, to expand that authentic, uh, that authentic base. Um, uh, another one would be uh, just quickly, uh, this stage in life, even more important to me, but hopefully to you too, is uh, spirituality. Um, the country is declining from a spirituality perspective, and I think that's not good. Um, and, and, and I would encourage all of you just to, to stay, to stay, to keep thinking about spirituality. It doesn't mean to be spiritual, you have to become a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu or whatever. I mean, if you do, God bless, it's wonderful. But at least you ought to be thinking about uh, how, why are we here? What, what, what's, the, what's the world all about? Why are we here? What do I want to do? How do I want to live my life and whatever? That's the beginning of a spiritual trail and it's just, I think, hugely important. And especially in, the, in your generation where we're seeing, we're seeing less of that. I just think it's, uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's very good. Uh, and, and another one is uh, ethics and values. Um, I, most people in this room, I'm sure, are blessed coming from a family where you have strong ethics and values. You know the difference in right and wrong. So as you go along in life, in business, uh, getting exposed to things, don't, don't give that up. Don't deviate from that. Don't be influenced by some new leader manager who comes in and says, well, it doesn't matter if you sort of halfway cheat on this. It does. You know the difference between right and wrong and, and, and values and hold to that. That's like really important. Um, so let me just close by saying, that um, those are just some thoughts. One that I think is a really good one to end on is what I call um, uh, right now there's a book being written uh, about your story. Everybody in this room. What do I mean by that? So it's a book's been written. You want to write your own book. You don't want somebody else to write it for you. And what does that mean? It means that I could, without knowing you, I could go do a little research, I could talk to your parents, I could talk to your teachers, I could talk to your friends and your coaches, and I could find out a lot about you. How hard do you work? What are your ethics? Uh, what, do you, what do you believe in? Are you a good person? Or whatever. Um, and, and so that is happening right now. And, and, and so you want to write your own book. You don't want to just wait around and all this stuff's going to happen at some point. You want to control what's, what you're doing and what's going to influence that to write the book you want have, to have written on, on you. So I encourage you to, to think about it. Um, uh, you know, write your own book. Don't let somebody else write it for you. Okay, so those are um, uh, just some bits of advice. As, as I said earlier, some of it will resonate, some of it won't, but um, um, uh, all of you have a great opportunity in front of you, and, and don't, don't get discouraged about all the stuff that happens out there. I mean, I felt the same way you probably do going into the real world. It's tough, uh, but it wasn't, you know? I mean, you can, you, you can discover yourself. Keep, keep growing, keep discovering, keep working hard, and, uh, and living in the greatest country in the world will produce uh, with that and the VES experience will produce uh, something very special with all of you. So great to be with you today and uh, I'd love to, uh, got a few minutes left, love to just uh, get any kind of questions. Uh, um, I'm happy to take anything you want to uh, ask. So, with, By the end of when? But by, by, by the end of the year, where do you see the S&P being? Uh, I, I am not bullish. Um, I think the odds are we, probabilities are we won't go into a recession of any magnitude, but we, we certainly could. And, but I think the next year or two will not be easy years. So I, I, I would be careful as an investor, because I, I don't think, the, I, I think it would be lucky if, it, if, it's, if the S&P is what it is now. Uh, year at the at year end. At three or four years out, different view. I think it's very positive, but I, I, I'm just cautious. So there's a lot of issues out there. Yes. Um, what are three things that you think are successful? 
Sorry, I couldn't. Three things that. Three things that you do daily as a success. Three things I do daily. I don't do a whole lot anymore, so. Uh, <laughs> Um, I do work out most every day. I think that's really important. Um, uh, I live in Florida in the, in the wintertime, and my friend and I started teaching school. We teach 11th graders and get into a lot of stuff we're talking about here. That's really satisfying because you're trying to give back. I've been a very lucky person, so you want to try to figure out some ways to give back. I spend a lot of time with my family uh, and, and two daughters and son-in-law, so, uh, and, and I play a lot of golf. So that's sort of, and I'm on a couple of boards, um, private equity boards that keeps me somewhat engaged, but it's not 24 by 7, so I did enough of that. Yes, sir? Is there anything you would change personally in the past that you want to do differently? Good question. Um, not really, you know, I, I get that question. Um, I, I, I've just been very lucky uh, in, in my life. And, uh, you know, the business career, I told you how that evolved. On the personal side, it's interesting, my vision was always to want to get married and have a family. Well, um, I had a lot of girlfriends along the way. None of them ever worked out until, you know, at age 42, I found somebody who was perfect. And we've been married for 37 years. I had two daughters and an older dad because of that. Um, so I, I would have gotten married early if I could have, but you got to find the right person. So no, I wouldn't change, I wouldn't change anything fundamentally. Yes, ma'am. If you could name one trait that's most important for you, Great question. Um, I, I think, actually, it's to me very clear. Leaders have to have a vision. I mean, think about it. Um, a leader is not going to be a leader unless he's got people to follow him. And unless you can articulate a vision as to why they ought to follow you, then you're not going to be much of a leader. You're not going to have anybody behind you. Um, and, and so you need to have a vision uh, about, you know, and our vision at J.P. Morgan was uh, we want to be one of the best banks in the world and we're going to do that through consolidation and bringing scale together and all that stuff. Um, that was a very clear vision. On the personal side, the vision was, was um, you know, be a, be a happy person. But I think having a vision for a leader is, is absolutely the most important thing to start with. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff after that. Yes, sir? My favorite memory of my time here was uh, well, you know, basketball was certainly a highlight because we, we won the conference championship. We were good. It was fun. Uh, but I'd say uh, just the experience that I've talked about of being with a new group of people. I came in. I was accepted. Becoming, you know, a leader in the school. That was a big deal to me. It helped me a lot to discover that I actually could maybe do that and, and liked it. So that, that would be the... The, the lasting takeaway right there. Yes? Um, during your career, what was your greatest motivation? And what have you done? Um, well, I think the, the greatest motivation was trying to figure out how you could win. Um, because your job, especially when you get into more senior jobs, is creating shareholder value. And if you're not in, our, in the capitalist world we live in, if a company's not creating shareholder value, then you're not going to be recognized, you're not going to get paid much, and you'll likely get fired. Uh, so, um, so I think trying to figure out how to win is important. And to me, that was, that was easy because I think uh, I've always been very competitive. Uh, sports had something to do with that. If you're competitive, it, it means you like to win. But, and then if you if, if you'd like to win, you got to ask the question, well, how do we win? Well, if, well, how do you win? You have to come up with a strategy. Uh, whether it's a basketball team, what's the strategy going to be against whoever? So it, it was, and it turns out I liked that. And that started playing to my strengths about, uh, and that, so that's what I, that's what drove me. And then, you know, trying to, trying to win, you got to create the, the right strategy, the right culture, you got to get the right people around, you got to get them to work together, and you got to execute. So it's doing that at a high level that really um, is, is very important. Yes, sir. Yeah, 
Yeah, um, I have some of my closest friends, um, like Erskine Bowles, probably my best friend, and it started here. Uh, and I was just with him two days ago. He was down in Florida, playing in the golf tournament with me. So, so I stay in touch. Bernard Baldwin, who's a Lynchburg guy, um, uh, is a really good friend. Uh, so I have a lot of good friends. We had a great, I had my 60th reunion, and that seems like a long way away for you, but it'll happen quicker than you think. And so we came back, and we had about 15 people in the class that came back, and that was awesome, catching up with everybody. So it's important to stay in touch with friends, for sure. I mean, building friendships is a critical thing to be happy in life. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Yes. Well, it certainly helped me get a job uh, because if I'd gone into chemical bank, you know, the first question is, what you major in? Well, majoring in e economics is helpful for, for, the, for the banking. It's not critical, but it was helpful. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was helpful. But, uh, um, you know, not being a, uh, a student, I'd say I didn't learn as much as some people did, but, but I started learning later. <laughs> Well, look, it's been, uh, it's been great being with you. It's been a real honor to be here, and thank you for listening to all this, and hopefully you'll have a few takeaways that could be helpful to you. Thanks. <laughs>